We are going to talk today about summertime. Um, we were chatting yesterday up on the floor and um, folks uh, gave me the suggestion of talking about things that are common in uh, summer. So I thought that would be a good way to start out the academic year. So um, if you guys have questions or things, you can throw them in on the chat. Uh, you can um, interrupt me. I don't care. It's not going to bother me at all. Uh-oh. Um, and um, I, I want this to be helpful. Just some common things that we see during the summer um, and that sort of thing. So we named it Summertime Blues. Anyone ever heard this song? I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll see. Right now, it's uh -oh. time for action. That's what now we have an ad. Hang on. Members, so they can pay for things like groceries before they worry about their insurance <laughs> or credit card bills. <laughs> Best slave plans, I guess. Today. Here we go. I mean, for those of you who know me, know that country music is my favorite. So it took me a while to find this. <laughs> okay, I've had enough. Um, <laughs> anyway, this slide uh, sharing is tough. Okay, so we're going to start with plant dermatitis. Anybody seen any cases of um, poison ivy recently? Yeah. So poison ivy is the most common one that you're gonna see in this region. We do have some oak and sumac, um, but honestly, clinically, it doesn't matter too much because they all sort of present the same. You will have patients that will come in and they will swear that they're not allergic to poison ivy and that this is poison sumac or what have you. Um, you, it, you can just agree with them, it's fine. Um, so I would just say, um, doesn't really matter. I'll go over the different leaf types here at the end, um, but those are the most common culprits. Uh, poison oak tends to be in the west more, and poison sumac tends to be um, in the southeast, I believe, um, but it really doesn't matter. Um, it's really caused by this urushiol in the plant, um, and a lot of people refer to it as like the plant oil, um, and it can be from any part of the, the plant. Even like dead vines can have this substance in it, and so um, I'm not really sure why my, my slides are doing that. My computer is possessed, but um, it can be um, from, uh, it can be even in the dead vines. So people who are clearing out um, dead vines along like a fence edge or around a fire pit or something like that, it's really common um, for them to experience that, um, even like out of season. Now, we obviously, obviously see this in the spring when people start like planting gardens or clearing out shrubs or whatever. Um, sometimes in the summer um, when there's a lot of overgrowth and people are weeding. Um, but it, you, you can even see it in the winter or in the fall. And one of the things to ask is whether or not they've had like a campfire recently or whatever, because sometimes the wood that they use to burn will have the oil on it. And so um, that can become aerosolized and then can also affect their skin at that point time and that's sometimes why you'll see people have it like around their eyelids um, or their eyes will be swollen um, because they have been exposed to the aerosolized version. It does affect all skin types and ethnicities. People with darker skin tend to have that like post inflammatory hyperpigmentation a little bit more than people who have fairer skin but um, really it doesn't matter um, as, as far as skin types and ethnicities and over 50% of the population will definitely have a reaction to the plant. Um, some people really just aren't affected by it at all and can easily like weed and take care of their yard and things without being affected by the poison ivy. I am personally not one of those people. I've had poison ivy before uh, and it is not fun. Um, just to remind you, it is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Um, so it, the symptoms that are early will develop in as early as four hours, but it's really common for them not to have any symptoms at all for uh, the first couple, three days. Um, and then symptoms will generally peak within one to 14 days after exposure, um, but people can find new lesions all the way up to three weeks after the initial exposure. Now, I know you probably have the same situation that I have all the time. 
besides possessed side slideshow, um, which is the fact that people will say, oh, it's spreading because they keep finding like new lesions or whatever. Um, and you have to help them understand that it's actually not spreading. They could be re-exposing themselves, which is a common thing, or it just could still be in the phase of like eruption um, up to the three week mark after the exposure. And a lot of times people can't really pinpoint the original exposure um, either. So sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to determine where that is. Um, remember, poison ivy is not contagious. It does not spread from the blisters. Um, I've had kids sent um, in for like notes, doctor's notes and things, um, because the school sends them home because they think that poison ivy is contagious. So just another thing to help educate your patients and particularly parents, the poison ivy is not contagious. You will not get poison ivy from the blisters. Now, if the person has the oil on their skin still, or perhaps it's on their towel and they share the towel in the bathroom or whatever, could they get poison ivy themselves without having actually been exposed to the plant? The answer is yes, um, but it's not spread from the blisters or from the seeping on those blisters. Um, obviously can be carried on clothing. The most common thing we see is like with our gardening gloves, gardening tools, um, animals. So if you take your dog out with you, you're working in the yard, whatever, and then you come in, take a shower, and you're really careful with all of your equipment, but yet you don't wash your animal, the animal can actually snuggle up against you and um, give the put that oil on your skin. It also is underneath their claws too. So something to think about if you have animals um, as to a possible place for exposure. Um, so anyway, um, the characteristic rash, we're all pretty familiar with it. Um, it's usually papules or plaques. And then generally there's at least some component of vesicle, uh, sometimes uh, coalescing to the point of bullae. A um, lot of times they're linear. We see these like streaks or lines. You can see that kind of in the top picture um, where the plant has made contact with the skin. Or like you're working in the plant and then you scratch your face. Sometimes you'll actually see lines uh, on, the, on, on the patient's face where that they've made contact um, with their skin. Uh, and the reason that obviously found in the face and genital area, you're working in the yard, you have to go and use the restroom, whatever, you don't realize that you've had an exposure. And so you can um, put that oil in the genital region as well. Um, I've seen plenty of people that come in with it on their inner thighs or genital region. Obviously, it's a very, very uncomfortable place to have um, plant dermatitis. Um, Obviously protection uh, from, from the plant itself, so wearing those gardening gloves, long sleeves, long pants, those types of things, particularly if you're going to be working with known areas that are at high risk. Sometimes, like I said though, you can get it from going to a campfire, and so there's really not a lot that you can do about that um, as, as far as like a visitor to that campfire. Um, barrier creams, they've studied that. They're a variable help, so they really don't um, recommend using them regularly as far as a prevention. Um, and then also uh, pre preventing, like inoculating yourself from your garden tools or your garden gloves, wash everything down. So um, again, remember to wash things that might not seem obvious, like your pet and things like that. Definitely sheets and towels. Try to take a shower before you go to sleep, of course, but if you don't, you have to wash those sheets the next day or your sheets will be a source of inoculation for, and not really inoculation, but exposure for you. Um, as, as you go in the future. Um, like I said, towels, uh, pets, gardening um, tools, like rakes, hose, the handles of those as well. Um, and then if the plant oil is not washed off your body within an hour, um, you're probably not going to wash off enough um, to, uh, to matter um, and prevent a reaction. So really try to take a shower as soon as you can when you come in from working in the yard. And then also people like buy these special scrubbers and they use like scrubs that you might use um, to wash your car or something. Don't wash your body with that because it really isn't gonna help, so. Um, 
As far as treatments, you know, we have the classic like soothing agents. Um, people have the um, calamine lotion, the pink stuff. Um, it, some people find it very soothing. Some people find that it doesn't help at all. Topical astringent, astringent can also be helpful because it can dry the lesion because sometimes the weeping of the lesion is the most bothersome thing to people, but mostly it's the pruritus. So if the weeping is bothersome, then you can use one of those astringents. Um, you do want to avoid the topical anesthetics like lidocaine or benzocaine because they do have an allergenic potential themselves. Uh, and then you want to avoid triple antibiotic ointments. First of all, it's not going to help at all. Um, and second of all, they have an allergenic potential. So you really don't want to add um, like a contact dermatitis from a neomycin um, to, to a uh, plant dermatitis. So topical steroids tend to work. I use these a lot, like if it's a small area and it doesn't involve areas around the eyes or the genitals. Um, you know, high potency steroid is gonna be your best bet. So don't mess around with telling them to use hydrocortisone cream over the counter. You really have to call in um, or send in, if you're examining the patient, a high potency steroid. Now, obviously you can't use those high potency steroids on thin areas like your uh, skin, the skin of your face or your genitals or like in your um, uh, inner trigonus areas. So you really um, have to decide like is, is a topical steroid really the best way to go and am I, am I going to get the best um, effect from that. Um, I would say outside of small patchy areas the mainstay of treatment that we use uh, are systemic steroids and you want to uh, if you're going to use oral steroids um, prednisone is fine you can use one of those dose packs it's not a problem um, sometimes they're kind of a pain to take because you you know have to take them all through the day and sometimes before you go to bed at night which can keep people awake so the big thing is always with steroids if you can remember to take them first thing in the morning with the meals um, so that some of that like um, jitteriness and insomnia will pass through the day and people can sleep better at night. Um, but you do have to start with high doses when you're treating a, a plant dermatitis. Um, so usually about 60 milligrams a day. And the other thing that's important to remember about oral steroids and plant dermatitis is that they must be tapered. Doing like a 40 milligrams a day for five days like we would do for COPD is not going to cut it. Um, people might start to get better, but the minute that you take the steroid away, they will rebound. That's the thing about plant dermatitis that can be a little bit unique, uh, is that rebound. So um, start with a high dose, and then you really have to taper over two to three weeks. Um, up to date said their uh, recommendation is over three weeks. Um, you know, I've had plenty of success doing it over uh, about two weeks too, but <clears throat> keep in mind, especially if people don't respond, you may just need to extend that taper um, and make sure you start with a high enough dose too. Um, the other option that you can uh, use in the office is IM steroids. A lot of times people will come in for their like yearly catalog shot or whatever, and that can be a way to treat seasonal allergies, but uh, also can be a way to treat um, poison ivy or poison oak. Um, so, but the best combination is to use a short-acting steroid and a long-acting steroid together. So generally we use triamcinolone, which is that catalog shot, and uh, for kids it's one milligram per kilogram. For adults usually you max that out at about 40 milligrams. And then the beta-methasone, usually we max that out at 12 milligrams. You give those together, that short acting starts to work sooner and then fades, and then you have the longer acting effect of the triamcinolone. I've also seen people use the triamcinolone and then do like a shorter taper of oral steroids. Um, so, uh, you know, they're just some ideas about ways to treat uh, plant dermatitis. Um, the thing also to remember is that uh, plant dermatitis is not histamine mediated. So taking the Zyrtec and the Allegra and the Claritin and things like that, that's fine for seasonal allergies because most people have them at the time that poison ivy is most prevalent. So it's fine for them to take that, but you have to tell them it's not going to help their poison ivy. Um, so uh, sedating histamines though have been studied and they mostly help because the itching keeps people up at night. So you can use some Benadryl or hydroxyzine or something like that at night um, for, for um, 
sleep primarily uh, because it's not going to help with the itch as much because it's not histamine mediated. All right, uh, there's the different plants that you're going to see that poison ivy, poison oak, and then poison sumac. Um, so, you know, they say what's the saying like uh, leaf, leaves of three, let it be or something like that. Um, so when you're out hiking, you can keep your eye open for these culprits. Any questions or thoughts? Am I missing like any kind of chat? I have a question, Dr. Bunch. Yeah. When you do the short and long acting um, IM steroids, are you doing full doses of both of those? Or are you yeah. like, mm -hmm. okay. Good question. All right. We'll move on then. All right, let's talk a little bit about heat illness. Um, we see this quite a bit. <coughs> and sometimes it uh, the public gets a little bit uh, distressed about how to treat heat illness. So I think it's good for us to kind of be aware of how to treat it and how to recognize the different forms of it. Um, risk factors for heat illness, there's um, strenuous exercise in high temps and high humidity. And the humidity is a factor because obviously you're not able to get the evaporation um, off the skin as easily and so the core temperature can more easily rise in high humidity conditions like July in Indiana. So um, just keep that in mind that the humidity is also a factor. Um, Obviously, poor physical fitness, if you're not very fit and you go out and try to play a softball game or something like that. Um, obesity, uh, pre-existing dehydration, so maybe you decided to go out and play a pickup basketball game, but you hadn't drank any water that day. That's going to affect things for sure. Um, any acute illness that you're also experiencing simultaneously will affect things, and then they call it external load. So that's basically like your clothing that you're wearing, if you're a football player, um, all the pads and gear and helmet and all of that. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like these things are going to keep heat more inside and your um, body temperature is going to go up. Um, so there are some uh, medications that increase the risk as well. I love this picture of the heat slayer beer um, because like actually it can make things worse, but <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, anticholinergic agents, anti-epileptic anti agents, um, ACEs, ARBs, antihistamines, decongestants, phenothiazines, thankfully we don't have a lot of patients on those, um, tricyclics, amphetamines, diuretics, beta blockers, lithium, and ethanol, um, you know, the heat slayer. So all these things um, can increase the risk for heat illness. And so if you have a patient that comes into the hospital with heat illness, you're going to want to take a really good medication history and make sure there weren't any confounding medications or um, things that can contribute to the severity of the illness. Um, so that's just a little list there. Um, there's a nice list and up to date too, so you can find it pretty easily if you have a patient that comes in with heat illness. Um, so there's some basic types of heat illness. I just want to go over them um, fairly quickly so that we can recognize them. Um, heat cramps uh, is like when there's a loss of water and electrolytes. Um, and you can uh, find this even, um, sorry, my computer is funky. Um, in cooler sports like swimming. Um, and then obviously it's increased risk with uh, the um, heavier the exercise or if they didn't eat or drink very well before they exercise. And the big thing is like distinguishing heat um, cramps from other illnesses like rhabdo or muscle ischemia and things like that. Uh, also sickle crisis, so make sure you think of that as well. Um, so as far as treatment, um, you do want to remove them from play so you can kind of evaluate them. You don't have to say that they don't get to go back in at all, but you do want to take them out and take a look. Um, 
And, uh, you know, the gone are the days when coaches say, well, you just need to play through it or you're not tough enough or whatever. No, these um, kids, if they're having a cramp, um, they need to be removed from play. Um, and sometimes you'll see this in adults, even at like family picnics and things like that. Maybe they were playing badminton and they never have uh, been playing that for any time recently and they get a cramp. Want to take them to a cool area and provide hydration. In these instances, oral hydration is just fine. It is very rare for them to need IV hydration. And then, of course, stretch the affected muscle. And if they don't respond to these measures, then you have to have a higher index of suspicion that something else is going on. Um, you know, like I said, rhabdo or muscle ischemia, etc. cetera. Um, so moving on from heat cramps to heat syncope. Um, in athletes, uh, the reason that people get heat syncope is because there's an abrupt decrease in that venous return. So after they complete an event, those of you who work Ironman or uh, marathons or even like minis um, or sprint races and that sort of thing. Um, sometimes you'll see this because, you know, they stop, especially if they like sit down right away or they don't like stretch or walk it off after one of those events. Um, they all have that abrupt return, uh, decrease in venous return and so that can get pre or syncopal. In people who are not athletes, it can occur. People who are standing in the heat with little movement um, or they're suddenly standing after prolonged sitting. Um, people will complain of lightheadedness. They'll say that I had that tunnel vision. They can get pale and sweaty. They almost look vagal <coughs> and in fact can have um, bradycardia. Um, and, but their core temp is usually normal. Um, now, a lot of times if you're at a sporting event or you're a spectator and you see something like this happen, um, you're not gonna whip out your rep rectal thermometer, um, but like, you're gonna be able to sort of identify if this person's having something significant or if it's milder. Uh, for instance, last year, um, I was at the city track meet um, and this lady, I, I would guess her to be in her 20s. Um, she was not a very fit uh, person and she was in the stands and she um, suddenly became like syncopole. And um, so they like, this this nurse actually she works in infection control she was there too and so she um called me over and um this uh woman had had a very brief episode of syncope with no injury and it was a very hot day very hot day and um all these spectators were coming rushing in and they were saying things like you're not supposed to give them anything cold. Someone please get some hot coffee and I need some hot water. And I was like, oh my. And so um, Elaine and I were able to like kind of dispel the crowd, get people away from her. And we took um, cold water bottles and um, put them in her groin and axilla and cooled her face. And then someone was scanning her and things like that. Um, and so you could tell that she had basically a heat syncopal episode because uh, she turned around really quickly and was able to take some hydration. And, that, and they had actually called the ambulance, of course, um, but she refused it when they got there. So that, that's like a really classic kind of scenario of heat syncope. So the treatment for these folks is to move them to a shaded area, which we did, someone had an umbrella, there was no shade otherwise. Um, and we had her lay down and elevate her legs because you do want to increase that venous return. Um, and then fluids to drink if they're not vomiting. Most of the time they're not. Occasionally they'll feel a little bit nauseous because of the vagal effect. Um, and then cool cloths uh, and then avoid standing quickly until symptoms resolve. If they resolve um, pretty quickly, it, you know, don't necessarily have to take them for any further medical treatment, as long as they're not having other symptoms, of course. Um, moving on to heat exhaustion. Um, this is when you have the inability to maintain adequate um, cardiac output. Um, it's usually through pretty strenuous physical exercise combined with high external temperatures. Um, you may or may not have dehydration. Almost always, though, they do need some fluid. Um, and it's characterized by a high temperature up to 104. Um, usually they have tachycardia, not bradycardia. Although I will say sometimes with heat syncope, they'll have a little bit of tachycardia. So don't let 
let that throw you off. Um, they generally complain of feeling weak or lightheaded. Sometimes they have headache. Sometimes the headache will have preceded their other symptoms. And then this, these are the people that have that prickly heat sensation. I, I, I think all of us at some point have had that like cold, hot, prickly heat uh, sensation when we've been outside in the heat all day. Uh, I feel like maybe I did when I hauled mulch last year. Anyone else? See, this is, this is the bad thing about Zoom. I'm not getting any laughter, and I know you guys think that was so funny. Anyway, um, belly cramps, uh, nausea, vomiting, also super common um, with heat exhaustion. Um, so, in, to treat this, you don't stand by while your, um, your co-athlete is laying on the ground, um, but you remove the athlete from play, for sure. Or if it's an elderly person, like take them away from the area that's hot. Um, uh, take them to a shaded area. Same type of thing as with heat syncope. You want to lay them down, elevate their legs, take away any excess clothing or gear. Sometimes people have like multiple layers on, even in the heat. Um, and uh, so take away that. And then obviously if they're an athlete and they have pads on or extra um, equipment, um, maybe they're a soccer goalie and they've got the long sleeve shirt on and the gloves, take all of that off so that they can dissipate that heat a little bit um, more uh, easily. And then cool the patient down. Um, same thing as what I was talking about, put cool compresses in the axilla of the groin. Um, if it's not an elderly patient, you can also put it around their neck. Um, uh, and um, cool, cool fluids, um, just like the, I don't know how this gets um, dissipated in the general society, but like giving them warm fluids or hot coffee or anything is definitely contraindicated. Um, sometimes these folks, are, they respond really well if you can kind of spray their skin as well, like those like spray fans that you give at Disney, that, that can actually help too. Um, and then IV fluids, if they're vomiting and they can't take oral fluids and their body's just rejecting it, which sometimes that gets to that point, then they're going to need to go in uh, and have treatment at a hospital facility. Um, if, if you suspect heat exhaustion um, and it's, it is significant, you probably should have them evaluated. Um, so then moving on to heat stroke, um, this is characterized by CNS dysfunction in combination with some other evidence of organ um, damage and high temperature. So the two main criteria for diagnosis is a temp above 104 and CNS dysfunction. And that can be any one of these scenarios. Um, a headache, it can be disorientation, it can be agitation, it can be a full out seizure um, all the way to coma. So any of these uh, from minor like sort of neurologic symptoms all the way to coma, if they have that plus a high temperature, that's definition of heat stroke. Um, some other symptoms that can accompany a uh, heat stroke, hyperventilation, tachycardia. Again, these folks are generally not bradycardic. They feel dizzy. Um, they're, they're often sweating. Um, we hear a lot like heat stroke, you don't sweat. And true, they don't have to um, be sweating profusely, um, but they don't also have to have dry skin um, to make the diagnosis. Because I see a lot of like um, algorithms like, uh, on the general web, not necessarily in medical literature, that talk about how heat stroke, the skin has to be dry. So be careful not to be um, uh, confused by that or be taken down that road um, and say, well, they must not have heat stroke if they're sweating. Um, they absolutely could have sweet heat stroke if they're sweating. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, dehydration, they'll be thirsty, have a dry mouth, uh, muscle cramps or loss of mu muscle function. Um, sometimes they'll complain of this and uh, ataxia. Obviously this list is not comprehensive and they don't have to have all of these symptoms to make the criteria uh, for, diag for diagnosis. Remember they just have to have elevated temperature above 104 and um, uh, some sort of CNS symptom. Okay, so how to treat it, the guiding principles. Um, uh, 
are obviously cooling, um, but the severity of heat illness might not be apparent during the initial evaluation. So just have a high index of suspicion. Uh, and then um, mor morbidity, mortality, keep this in mind, are directly related to how long that core temperature was elevated. So rapid treatment is essential, and they say to think of um, like a heat exhaust or heat stroke like a heat attack. Like, treat it quickly like a stroke, like a stroke one, or a, a heart attack. Um, so of course you assess your ABCs like everything. You get your vitals quickly and they say that a rectal temperature is the only accurate measurement, which can be a little bit tricky um, to get obviously in the field. But if you take an oral temperature or um, a temperature by other means and you have a high suspicion, you can't rely on that as your core temperature diagnosis, but it can prompt you to like move it along and get the patient care quickly so that they can get a rec an accurate rectal temperature. Meanwhile, you can start the cooling that needs to happen. Also checking a glucose is helpful um, to make sure that that's not a, con a confounding factor. And um, if onsite cooling is not available, you need to get them to the ED immediately. Um, you definitely want to remove that extra gear like we talked about. Pretty much every scenario, if they have extra gear on, take it off. Um, they do say ice immersion if possible. You have to be careful with this with the elderly, but um, with athletes, you can just put them in ice. Um, if, you, if no ice immersion is available, you can go back to those ice packs in the groin and axilla. And then the spray fans are really helpful because what that's doing is um, perpetuating um, the uh, cooling by the evaporative method, right? So you put on that, you put the water on the skin and then you spray a fan so that the cooling can happen. Now in humid conditions, that evaporation is not gonna happen as quickly as you want it to, but that's one method to try to help. Um, and then obviously keeping these people in the shade and away from any further sun. Um, Cooling blankets and chilled IV fluids have actually not been shown to help. I've seen them used before and stomach lavages and things like that. All of those methods haven't really been shown to help as much as like the external cooling and, and just hydration in general as well. And then of course you have to monitor vital signs very closely in these folks. Um, if you have a patient that comes in and has had some treatment in the field, your secondary survey needs to be a good neuro exam. You want to check those muscles for any signs of compartment syndrome because that can be a complication of this. And also you need to think of other things that could be going on, right? Could, could this be malignant hyperthermia, particularly if muscle rigidity is present? where uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and other heat illnesses, honestly, are usually, they may have a muscle spasm, but they shouldn't have muscle rigidity. Most of the time, they're actually feeling kind of weak, and um, they use the word flaccid and up-to-date. I'm not sure I really love that, because it, it sort of connotates like denervation, but you shouldn't have muscle rigidity. Um, look for SIRS criteria, of course, because, you know, you need to make sure that this temperature elevation um, is not representative of something else going on, and then take a really good thorough history of, of the precipitating events, because sometimes, um, you know, they... Uh, um, they help, like, you know, the person can tell you, I have been sick lately, or I just got out of the hospital for pneumonia or whatever. So some of that really does help. And then, especially with athletes, make sure you talk to them about drugs and supplements uh, and recent illnesses, because sometimes athletes will obscure those recent illnesses because uh, they want to play. Um, and so just trying to take a really good history from those athletes can be a little bit tricky too. And then, of course, sometimes we forget to ask about supplements, uh, and they're not always thinking that that's actually something that could affect them so they don't tell you sometimes they're trying to hide it from you but sometimes they're like not trying to hide it from you they just don't tell you that they're on some sort of supplement so make sure you take a good history that way all right and then if they are in your um, care you want to definitely get a CBC CMP because you really need to look at of course your renal function your electrolytes as well as those liver enzymes because you really need to make sure that those are um, okay your analysis, uh, CK, of course, we're looking for rhabdo with that, and then magnesium um, can often be uh, altered as well, uh, and then coagulation studies, because sometimes it can go into DIC. 
Um, supportive therapy. I thought this picture was so funny. I don't even know. What is that machine? What is the green machine? I don't know. Um, but supportive therapy. Um, you want to make sure they're cooled, the fluid resuscitated, correct those electrolytes. Um, and there's really no role for antipyretics, interestingly, because remember, heat illness does not involve any kind of change in that hypothalamic um, set point. Um, it's it's uh, in a different area, like it's more peripherally involved. And so antipyretics are not going to help you lower that temperature. Um, and then, of course, you diagnose and treat complications. Do they have an AKI? Are they in rhabdo? Um, do they have any liver failure or DIC or whatever? So you want to identify those and treat those. All right, that was heat illness. What kind of questions do you guys have? <clears throat> I would also have a real low threshold for doing an EKG on these people with heat illness that end up in your emergency department. Yep, excellent point. And, and, and including, because you don't know the situation, including like your cardiac enzyme and things like that, because that, that could have been a precipitating factor or a complicating factor from the heat illness. You can have concomitant things going on. And by the way, Allison is texting me and said she's actually laughing at my jokes. Thank you so much. That really means a lot. <laughs> oh my. Okay. Um, Next, we're we'll talking briefly about sunburn. Um, obviously, it's uh, more common in fair skin, uh, red hair, blue eyes. Sorry, people that have that kind of um, skin tone, but you're at risk. So make sure you wear your sunscreen. Um, that erythema comes on in about, um, oh my, are people like writing things that I'm not seeing? I don't know. Anyway, um, erythema comes on about three to six hours, uh, usually on by three days. Uh, remember, it is a prostaglandin and nitrous oxide mediated inflammation, and that will come into play in the treatment. So um, I think that's an important kind of point that we don't always remember about sunburn. Um, obviously, we know there are certain medications that increase photosensitivity. So like the tetracyclines and your retinoids um, and uh, some other medications, you know, that increase it. I don't know if you think of anything, shout it out. But there are medications that increase the photosensitivity <clears throat> and can make that sun, sunburn um, appear a little bit worse. Um, as far as treatment, it really is... Um, uh, you really do use those calamine or aloe-based topicals. I, I know Jocelyn's telling me if I check on, click on the chat, but for some reason my computer is not allowing me to do that. I don't know what the deal is. I am so sorry, folks. No, I have no idea what, why I can't. I cannot see your chats, so I'm sorry. Um, Q&A? Nope. Uh, maybe? Hang on. Are you, you're probably not seeing my, um, screen now, right? No, we're, we're seeing it. So what are you seeing? Like my my home screen or? Yeah, you're like internet. Um, I don't know what. There was I a question in that? chat, but I went ahead and answered it, Jen, so I think you can go ahead. Okay, that's if I can get my screen shared again. Yeah. It's sharing. I need, uh, I need, Someone, we have someone I need someone to sit with me and help me with the Zoom. So, um, anyway, I'm trying. Sorry, I can't even get my screen back up now. I, I honestly don't know. I see sunburn prevention. Huh. I can't do it. I don't know what's wrong. Sorry, I want to see what maybe that's going on here. So we can't actually see. We we could see your actual um, screens. I don't know. It won't. It, when I pull this up. But yeah, you gotta. 
I think we're seeing things that she is not actually seeing. But now. So you guys see sunburn prevention? See, look, I can't, I cannot. Yeah. I cannot get that chat before it would not come up. I don't know what the deal is. And then I had this weird thing down here. Oh, here we go. I see your chats. I'm so sorry. I was not. Um, I think we may be back to it now, though. Yeah. I, I think, like, just having three people walk in and try to rescue me <laughs> may have helped. <laughs> Don't go too far because I might need you. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so, sunburn prevention, obviously, is stuff, kind of boring. Stay in the shade, wear the UV clothing. If you need a good, uh, company that makes UV clothing, Ash Shriner, it's so cute. There's so many cute uh, clothes that are UV clothing. Um, she has a really good uh, company that makes it. Long sleeves and pants, uh, wide brim hats, of course, and that's really good for infants because um, <laughs> Cooper said my computer's rebelling against Alan Jackson, which is so true. What was I thinking starting this whole thing with country music? That's the problem. Um, anyway, um, sunscreen uh, is not recommended on young babies, so that's where those wide brim hats and those UV clothing and things like that for your young babies, and then keeping them in the umbrella and stuff. And if you have to have them out, jumping in the waves and things like that, which is fine and fun, just you can put a little bit of sunscreen on their face or any exposed areas, but really try to not use sunscreen in kids less than six months is the current recommendation. Um, okay. So that's it for sunburn. Any questions? Let me see if I can pull up the chat. Uh, I have a question about the utility of SPF, you know, greater than 30. Yeah. I've heard they're equal. I mean, you don't need SPF 70 or... Right. It's it's supposed to correlate. And um, if anyone else has advice, um, advice on this, uh, the um it's supposed to correlate with how long um it's it works so if it's 30 then it's supposed to work 30 minutes if it's 70 it's supposed to work 70 minutes um i'm not really sure if that's ever been validated um the big thing is the reapplication um of it so any alternatives to silver sulfidine yeah um piercing you can use mupiracin um, instead of um silver um and remember, if they have a sulfa allergy, they cannot use that sylvadine cream. Um, why no sunscreen less than six months of age? Um, oh, sorry. I, I'm actually giving a lecture. I have a question, but I don't have the chat option. For oh, the okay, what is it? So we were talking about less than six months old using like a barrier zinc oxide. Mm -hmm. Can we use it for diaper cream? Yeah. Is that okay for Yes. Sunblock prevention, just yes. other options for our patients. Yes. So Kimmy is poking her head in, and it was a joy to see her. Um, and she <laughs> asked about um, using zinc oxide for the younger babies, and that's absolutely fine. The biggest thing with why no sunscreen in less than six months is because of some of the other chemicals that are involved in it and getting, like, because, you know, babies are putting things in their mouths and getting in their eyes and um, things like that. But since you do use zinc oxide on their bottoms, it is safe for their skin. It's just more being con cautious about them eating it or getting in their eyes and things along those lines. Um, and then... Yeah, and I think you're right, Kelsey, there are some hormonal things. I'm not as well versed on that. So if you um, have some um, other pearls, that would be awesome. And then yes, making sure the, the sunscreen is broad spectrum, getting UVA and UVB um, lights. Um, Another yeah. tip is I have a patient who has had multiple basal cell carcinomas removed and he's gotten very good about wearing UVF protected protective clothing now and uh, so he'll wear a hat and a long sleeve swim shirt when he's outside a lot of times and that's a great thing and patients can get UV protective clothing pretty pretty easily available nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah um, it, that's true it's much more widely available than it and than it used to be. And a funny story I'll share. I covered the Ironman event just as a helper, a volunteer physician about three years ago. 
had an athlete turn up after the race was like heat exhaustion kind of thing. We were working him up and then the athlete kind of disappeared on us. And we found him about 10 minutes or so later. He had crawled into one of the ice chests. It was like this giant, you know, like you see at the gas station that contains all the bags of ice. He had crawled inside of that. And so actually pretty effective treatment, but they, uh, they had to extract him out of there. Um, <laughs> so you'll see some crazy stuff. Um, and one other last tip going back all the way to plant dermatitis. I have struggled with that over my life. I've had it really bad a few times. Um, somewhere along the way, I got a tip to use degreaser. Um, me, Ari had shared about using dish soap and um, that, that does break up grease. Another really good degreaser is goop hand cleaner. You can buy it for about five bucks. It comes in a big tub. and It's a, it's a degreaser product. So when I, when I grew up working with my grandfather, on farm equipment, we'd get our hands all covered in black grease and we would just smear that goop on it would take all the grease off. And it, it, is, it is able to remove that, that uh, Urushol uh, from the skin and it does a pretty good job. You can buy an aftermarket product called Xanafel. Xanafel costs about $50, goop costs about $5. And every time I go in the woods, I come home and I, I scrub and the, I just put goop on me and then I wash off with regular soap. And I haven't gotten poison ivy except for one time in, in about 10 to 15 years now. That's a great point. I hadn't heard of using goop like on your body that way. It makes sense, it makes complete sense. Good stuff, guys. All right. Um, okay. Uh oh. There we go. Uh, last thing I just wanted to go over real quick with you guys was dog bites because you see a lot of these in the summertime. Um, this is a really common reason for people to call in to come into the office or sh um, show up in the ER and you may even get ER notes on your patients um, that they popped into the ER for this and I just want you to know a few little pearls about treating dog bites. Um, they do account for about 90% of animal bites, um, about 10% are cats. I don't know like what the percent of like uh, reptile bites and stuff like that are, but in, in our um, world, most of them are dog bites and then you have 10% that are cat bites. Um, the victims, unfortunately, are often children, especially boys age 5 to 9. I will give you like three guesses as to why that is. Um, and uh, anyway, just so that you know, a rare, it's very rare to have rabies from a dog by a domesticated animal in the developing world, or the developed world. Um, now, in the developing world, um, rabies from stray dogs remains like a common issue. And um, so uh, just remember that I'm referring to dog bites that are in um, the U.S. when I'm talking about them today. Um, so young children, it's often the face that's affected. Uh, a good friend of ours um, recently, well, I don't know, maybe a year or year and a half ago, um, her own dog bit her and she had like a nice laceration through the vermilion border. I just want to make sure that you realize that you really shouldn't glue those. Um, that person ended up going to the ER and had it glued and it just looked terrible and so, um, I ended up helping them to get to the plastic surgeon and she had it repaired and it looks so good like you can't even tell where it was now. So um, helping your um, patients get the right care is also um, potentially something that you'll be involved in um, after the bite, even if you're not actually treating the bite. So just keep an eye on that. And if it goes over through the vermilion border, that's not something that you're gonna glue or someone else should glue. Um, other uh, children and adults, um, kids that are older anyway, um, they tend to be more extremities. Um, the evidence of infection generally develops in the first, or right, right about that 24 hour mark. Um, you usually don't need to do any imaging in, unless you suspect there's like a deep infection or like there's neck fash or something along those lines. But generally with a dog bite like the one you're seeing on the screen, you would not need to do any imaging for those or even ones that have um, lacerations with them. Um, Wound management, remember you are required by law to make sure that there's a dog bite report filled out. 
Um, we have the forms here. So if you see a patient in the office, um, you can fill out the form. If not, you can contact animal control. Animal control will help you fill out the form. Uh, law enforcement, they all know how to fill out the form. So if you have questions, you can ask one of us or um, usually Amy or Wendy will have an idea of the form that you need to fill out too, uh, but it is required. The dog also must be able to be observed. Um, uh, now, sometimes you'll have a stray dog bite and then you have to have a discussion about the risk for rabies. Honestly, still, even with stray dogs in Indiana, um, there's not been a documented case of rabies in like, I don't even know how many years, many, 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 many years. And so uh, most of the time rabies is not, in, rabies vaccination is not indicated, um, but it is something to have a discussion with about the patient with the patient and the family um, but definitely update that tetanus shot remember um, contaminated wounds five years regular um, updates for tetanus is 10 so even if someone comes in with a um, tetanus that was like nine and a half years ago and they don't want one um, that's outside the window for some uh, contaminated wounds so usually we'll go ahead and update those folks um, clean the um, clean the wound with soap and water. You can use like uh, HIPAA cleansing water, um, and and cleansing it well and early on is really important. Uh, you do not need to culture the wound or anything like that, and then you have to decide if closure is needed. Um, you don't want to close old wounds, and the definition of an old wound is more than twelve hours. Um, I think I actually have that reverse more than 12 hours on the body and then more than 24 hours on the face i will update that slide um, because the face is more vasculature or vascular um, sometimes they allow that correct me if i'm wrong wilson i don't i think that's right um, but the face is more vascular and um and so they um they, they usually do better um, to close those. You really don't want to close them unless you have to. Sometimes if they're uh, wide and gaping, you, you really do have to close them, but you want to make sure you irrigate those and cleanse those wounds really well. The ones you don't want to close are the ones that with pretty severe crush injury, those are just going to have to heal by secondary intention. Um, any deep puncture wounds that are not associated with laceration, you leave those alone. Hands and feet, unless absolutely necessary, you don't want to close those because um, the infections that you can get in the hand and the feet, um, particularly around the tendons and such, that's just a bad scenario. So try not to have to have to close those wounds on the hands and feet unless you absolutely have to. And then those who are immunocompromised, including people with diabetes, uh, and then those who have stasis, not Stacy. Okay, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis uh, is recommended in anyone that gets a primary closure, in anything that's on the face, the hands or the genitals, um, if it's near the bone or the joint, um, if it's near lymphatic compromise, including any kind of like vascular grafts or anything like that, those people need to be on antibiotics. Any deep puncture, crush injury, or immunocompromised host. So you're going to prophylax a lot. In fact, you're probably going to prophylax most of the um, uh, dog bites that you see. Okay, yeah, she did confirm 24 hours on the face and 12 hours other sites. I thought I had those reversed, so thank you for helping me with that. Um, and remember, that's because the face is so vascular, and plus it's more, you, you have more time because you really want to make sure that cosmetically is uh, appropriate as well. And if you don't feel comfortable fixing it, then don't fix it. Call plastics, but if you're in a place where you're the only one, um, then... <clears throat> Make sure you get a lot of uh, suture and plastics training during your residency. See, it's July 1st. You have, the world is your oyster. You, you can learn a lot of stuff. All right. All right. So um, what do you give them? You give them augmentin. You give them augmentin. You give them augmentin. You give them augmentin. If they can't take augmentin, you have to give them one of these. And honestly, I look this, this table up all the time. This is one of my favorite tables in UpToDate. Um, so you give them one of those following agents, like with the, the Doxy, the Bactrim, the Pen VK, um, Cipro, Leviquin, but again, try to stay away from those clonolones these days. And then you have to also give something for your anaerobes, so metronidazole or Clinda. And remember, a lot of things like skin and soft tissue, we use Clinda by itself, but not for dog bites, okay?
You can also use Moxie, but again, we try to stay away from those quinolones um, as much as we can. All right, and that's it.